Today, we are going to design a fizzy bubble sound effect instrument rack, heavily inspired by Sophie's Lemonade. Similar sound effects can also be found in Livestream Heaven Suspended. Throughout this video, we will have a glimpse of the immense power Ableton Operator and Max for Life LFO have to offer. First, create an instrument rack and drag in operator, then bring in an arpeggiator and two LFOs under the Max for Life audio effect tab. To avoid confusion, name the first one as LFO1 and the second one as LFO2. Then set the arpeggiation style to random, toggle free rate and map the gate parameter onto macro 1. This will be crucial in controlling the density of the bubbles down the road. For now, increase gate length to 120%. Now set LFO1's waveform to random and LFO2's to ramp down. Map LFO1 to LFO2's rate, then map LFO2 onto arpeggiator's free rate. You can totally map a random LFO onto the arpeggiator's rate directly, but I like the good balance of chaos and order by employing cyclic waveforms such as ramp down, ramp up, sine, etc., while randomizing its rate essentially creating a repetitive phrase with varying lengths. Then adjust LFO1's smooth parameter to 50% and lower its rate to 0.5 Hz. On LFO2, turn up jitter and smooth to 13% and 30% respectively. After that, rescale both LFO's minimum and maximum modulation value to the following setting. The main purpose of this is to prevent the LFOs from going bonkers fast, which can introduce unwanted digital artifacts. In this tutorial, we will be doing this type of rescaling rather frequently. This allows us to have finer control when we modulate different parameters using the same LFO. Now create a MIDI clip and draw in four to five arbitrary notes ideally within the range of C1 to C4. We will be auditioning this clip in our process constantly in order to understand how different parameters affect our result. Go to Operator. Turn up the master volume to minus 6 dB and choose the reverse L-shape algorithm. Turn off oscillator D since we won't be needing it. Then set the course parameter of oscillator A and C to 2 and 0.5 respectively. The algorithm defines the relationship between oscillators. In our case, oscillator A is sent to the filter unaffected by other operators, while oscillator D is modulating oscillator C, which subsequently modulates oscillator B, and the final signal is sent to the filter. Let us set up oscillator A. Before we begin, insert a limiter at the end of your instrument chain. This is a good habit to have in case things go wacky at any point. Adjust the envelope accordingly. Then turn on loop mode and leave the looping time at the default 100 milliseconds. This enables re-triggering of the oscillator envelope as long as the MIDI note gate allows. In the final result, oscillator A will play a supportive yet crucial role as tiny water droplets and bubbles that fill up the gaps. Hence, turn the volume down to around minus 12 as well. Now go to oscillator B. Turn its volume all the way up and adjust the envelope to the same shape as oscillator A. We will be modulating its attack and decay with an LFO later, but for now, a generic pluck shape envelope will do. 
Then turn off the filter for now and navigate to Oscillator B's Waveform Editor. Give the monotonous sine wave a little bit of color. Click and drag to adjust the amplitude of individual partials. Ideally, the result should sound like you are tapping on thick glass with your fingertips. This is totally up to taste, but try not to go overboard. We'd much prefer it remaining clean and pristine. As for oscillator C, it's rather simple. Initialize its sustain level back to 0 dB, then shorten the release time to 12 milliseconds. Lastly, modulate oscillator C's level with LFO1. You can map the same LFO onto different parameters by clicking onto its drop-down matrix. Then rescale the max modulation value to around 50%. This randomizes the amount of frequency modulation oscillator C is applying onto oscillator B. And now, before we move on, let's take a listen at what we have at the moment. Much better, we certainly are getting there. Now, this is where it truly comes to life. Switch on the filter and select High Pass Filter. The reason why we are using a High Pass Filter instead of a Low Pass has to do with why bubbles and water droplets sound the way they sound. It begins with the droplet breaking surface tension, creating a higher, crisper tone, and ends on the surface tension, pulling the body of water back together, which creates a lower, deeper tone. That's why we need to use a high pass filter. We let the high frequency resonance ring first before we open up the filter and allow any lower frequencies in. Sorry for going off on a tangent. Now from the filter circuit drop down menu, select either MS2 or SMP. These are different analog circuits Ableton has modeled their filters after. Feel free to experiment but I found these two most suitable for today's purpose. Now adjust the filter envelope to a basic pluck shape such as this. We will be applying LFO modulations on the attack and decay time later on, so just make sure you have a sustain level of 0% and a release time of around 30 milliseconds. Turn your cutoff frequency all the way up and increase the resonance to around 93%. Careful not to go beyond 99%, or this cheeky little fucker may blow up your ears. Now play around with the filter envelope amount, and you'll be in for a surprise. Ah, music to my ears. Next. Drag in another LFO and name it LFO3. Select random waveform and set the rate to around 5 Hz. Then give it a little bit of smooth, somewhere around 10 to 15%. This will act as our main source of random modulation on both filter envelope and oscillator B envelope. Now, map LFO3 onto filter envelope amount, and then lower the max modulation value to 50 to 55%. This is due to the fact that filter envelope amount is a bipolar parameter which ranges from minus 100% to plus 100%. Since our cutoff frequency is at highest point, we need only negative values for the filter envelope modulation. Then map LFO3 onto filter envelope attack time as well and rescale its minimum and maximum modulation value to 30% and 0% respectively. By having the minimum value higher than the max value, we are essentially flipping the polarity of the modulation. Lower LFO value means higher attack time and vice versa. After that, do the same thing with filter envelope decay time and adjust the modulation range to between 65 to 37 percent. Finally, return to oscillator B envelope. Map LFO3 onto the decay time and set the modulation range to between 35 to 
Then, in order to introduce some variety in our random modulation, map LFO1 onto oscillator B's attack time instead, and without flipping its polarity, set the modulation range to 0 to 35%. In truth, we are basically done, but why stop here? In the upcoming section, we are going to add a couple audio effects and macros that had greatly improved this instrument's playability and resampling potential. By the end of this video, we'll be using up to 10 macros. We can increase the number of visible macros by pressing the plus button on the instrument rack. Now map the time parameter onto macro 2. This allows us to control the length of all envelopes within operator globally. Going below 0% shortens the envelopes, creating a clickier texture while going above 0% lengthens the envelopes, dramatizing the bubbly character in a cartoonish fashion. Next, map the filter resonance onto macro 3. Since we do not want the filter to self-oscillate, we need to limit Macro 3's maximum value to under 100%. Open Macro Mapping tab and adjust the max value to 99%. Excellent. We can also control oscillator A's envelope looping time with a macro. This essentially controls how quick oscillator A generates the little bubbles. Map it onto macro 4 and rename it oscillator A density. In this section, we are going to utilize both MIDI and audio delay devices to improve our instrument's range of intensity and complexity. First, bring in note echo under MIDI effects. Place it right between arpeggiator and operator. Then toggle time-based delay mode and map LFO2 onto its delay time. Set the modulation range to between 2 to 50%. Since Note Echo uh, is a MIDI device, it does not have a dry-wet parameter. Instead, its amount parameter defines the velocity of the delayed MIDI notes. Now, map Note Echo's delay amount and feedback onto Macro 5, rename it, and adjust the minimum and maximum values to your liking. I opt to cap feedback at 50%. We can also bring in grain delay. We'll be using it to smear our signal into clusters of randomly pitched water bubbles. 
This tool is of paramount importance in creating both metallic and liquid texture, which warrants an in-depth explanation in a separate video. But for now, toggle time-based delay mode and map LFO1 onto pitch parameter. Then rescale the minimum and maximum modulation values to between 90 to 25%. This is to prevent extreme pitch shifting that would introduce artifacts that are unsuitable for today's purpose. And I'm flipping the polarity, because why not? Play around with other parameters and find a sweet spot that is most natural sounding to you. Now let's figure out a way to control our grain delay with a macro. Easiest way would certainly be mapping it directly onto dry wet. However, it's pointless to have it fully wet since that would take away the moist, juicy bubbles we have worked so hard for. A feasible option would be randomizing its dry wet with an LFO and control such LFO's depth with the macro. Bring in a new LFO and name it LFO4 Turn up its rate, select Random Waveform, then map it onto Grain Delay's Dry Wet. Next, map LFO4's depth and offset onto Macro 6. Due to LFO being a bipolar device, controlling a unipolar parameter, that is Grain Delay's Dry Wet. Without adjusting offset, our Grain Delay's Dry Wet would stuck at 50% even when LFO4's depth is at 0%. Navigate to the Macro Mapping tab once again and adjust Offset's maximum modulation value to 0% and leave the minimum modulation value at the default negative 100%. To demonstrate it with a sine wave, we now able to control the range of modulation with Macro 6. Before we move on, map grain delay feedback onto Macro 7. At last, bring in Hybrid Reverb. This is a powerful tool that combines convolution reverb and multiple digital reverb algorithms. Its sound design capabilities cannot be overstated. However, let's keep it simple today. Go to the Routings drop-down menu and select Convolution Mode. This means we are using only the convolution reverb engine. After that, set the pre-delay to two milliseconds then navigate to the Convolution IR section and under the Early Reflections category, select Synagogue Wide LR. However, feel free to use any reverb your heart desires. Now simply map the Dry Wet parameter onto Macro 8. And there you go. Sussy. Now, let's wrap things up with some stereo imaging and dynamic processing. Drag in one last LFO and name it LFO5. Select random waveform as usual, then map it onto operator's pan parameter. Lastly, control the LFO's depth with macro 9 and name it random panning.
As for dynamic processing, I'm just going to use the good old Ableton OTT, map its dry wet onto our last macro, then some basic EQ and saturation. However, go slay, go crazy, go wacky, put six drum buses on top of one another, if you so wish to. The world is yours. So this is it. Uh, thank you for spending time with me today. And I just want to say this tutorial is merely my interpretation of one of Sophie's ideas within the vast artistic wonderland she left us with. I'm by no means trying to claim anything as my own or original. Rather, I want to share the joy of exploring the uncanny nature of sonic hyperrealism. Putting the sounds we have so taken for granted in our everyday life under the limelight, observing them through our own idiosyncratic kaleidoscope. I want to bring you into the very same world Sophie has brought me into through her music, where technology makes its futile attempt to mimic nature, yet creating something new and unique in the process. <laughs> 